Welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our CPR series looks at certain topics that come up in life, and we attempt to discuss them in a way that relates to everyone. At times, we bring in the arguments of those opposed to the Word of God in order to practice contending for the faith that God gave His church. It is our prayer that you will be equipped to give a defense for the truths of the Christian faith with humility and respect. Glad to have you with us at Burden and Blessing today. We are going back and taking a look at one more of these religions that we've been considering in the past that are non-Christian in nature. We have covered a lot of them from the Eastern religions of the world. We're coming back a little bit closer to home today with one that is familiar to many, many people. You'll see these in many towns across our nation. We're going to be taking a look at the Masonic Lodge and other items related to that. Joining me to go through the Masonic Lodge today is Pastor Ben Libby. Ben, glad to have you with us as we get into uh, one of these religions that's a little bit closer to home than some of the ones we've considered in the past. Yeah, you, you see these Masonic Lodges all over the place, I think, and maybe there's been a couple times that you might have passed one and wondered, oh, hey, there's that Freemasonry place. I wonder what, what's going on in there. I know I have, but uh, yeah, I guess we'll find out. Now, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people today would take a look at these uh, lodges and they would say, well, there's really nothing religious in nature about them. These are, are secular organizations. You know, So why are we talking about this as a religion if it is a secular organization? Well, I think the secular part of it is very important to bring up, Nathaniel. Um, it, I think a lot of the draw that the Masonic Lodge has is social connections. Um, it's it's not easy to get in to one of these places, like to become a member. I think we'll probably talk about touch on that later. But uh, so it is a big part of it to be socially connected to these presumably influential people and to be a part of this society. But at the same time, they make definite statements about God and who and what He is. Most of it is is about anyone can believe in any god that they choose, you know. And you know that's we say that we say that too. That's freedom of religion. That's what our that's what the United States gives us. But they equate them all to be the same, and that is false doctrine. You'll see these all over the country. Uh, you'll you'll sometimes they're even called temples, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're actually yep. called a Masonic temple. Why is it then that it, even though there are these secular connections, that people miss the religious implications of it when it's right on the front of their building? Yeah. Well, I think I think the the connections are very important, um, but I think also though you you really see that. I guess I would I would answer the question is they they kind of water down all religion essentially they they bring it they believe they they'll confess in the god um it's not you know Nathaniel like some of the other podcasts we talked about some of the other world religions they're not polytheistic and they they're very monotheistic they say they say that there is one god they call him the et eternal supreme grand master of the universe sometimes they call him the father of all men so you know father of all men you know you and i as christians the thing we'd see that and be like yeah we can kind of get behind that the father of all men idea because that's what god the father is but they also refer to him as the nameless one of a hundred names uh so um that's kind of a weird title for a god who very clearly tells us his name and not only tells us his name but tells us to honor and sanctify that name um so they really by trying to be trying to include every person and every religion under this umbrella of freemasonry they really destroy any concept of who and what god is Let's get into some of the religious implications of this organization. Now, I mentioned early on that 
when we're talking about the Masonic Lodge, this actually trickles over into other similar organizations. So there's a whole bunch of different lodges that are out there. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the Elks Lodge, you've got the Moose Lodge, um, and then we could even talk a little bit about the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scout organizations, which again have a lot of similar tenets to the lodges. Can you just kind of you you mentioned that you know what it does that it it presents this God that is generic so that everybody can say, oh, yep, I believe in this God. And, and if you come in with your preconceived notion of God and you hear what they're talking about, you're going to say, okay, that's mine. And somebody else who has got a different version of God is going to come and say, oh, they're talking about my God. And you can all feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. What's the problem with that? Well, yeah, like I said, it's, it's that if you look at what at the real religion teaches, what our religion says, what does Jesus say? He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you are part of one of these organizations that says whatever, you know, whatever type of higher power you believe in, that's that's great. We want you to do that. We want you to keep doing that. Do that to the best of your ability. But then <laughs> But if I'm doing that, and then my same person next to me is also doing that, but is is trying to serve Allah to the best of their ability, and when we're the group, we're together in the same group that teaches something that's very religious, isn't that fellowship? Isn't that you know? Aren't how can I be a part of the same organization and praise God, the living God, the one true God, with the same you know? It's not with the same with the person who believes in a completely different God, but we're we're both saying that we're religious together. It's just very, very confusing, and it really blurs the lines of what is what. I think. You know, one of the ways that I I like to consider this this whole discussion of and this hap- this is related to all these other religions that we've talked about too. You know, you get you get an example of years ago when. There was uh, the ecumenical prayer services and things like that. There were some mm-hmm. people that said, hey, you know, we we and the Muslims, we worship the same God. We both agree on the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Okay. Hmm. I, I can understand what they're saying. They would both – what they're saying is that we both confess that there is a God out there who is our Father who created the world. The problem is that within Christianity, that God who is our Father, who has created the world, that God is also Son and Holy Spirit. It is his triune. If you strip the Son and the Spirit from the triune nature of God, then that is not the same God the Father that we worship as Christians, which is exactly what the Muslims do, what the Freemasons do. What the Hindus do, all these other religions of the world, they, even though they use terms that sound the same as what we use in Christianity, doesn't mean that it's the same person. Mm-hmm. How many Ben Libbies do you think there are in the world? Uh, probably quite a few, actually. Probably quite a few. But there's only yeah. one that is a pastor in Tacoma, Washington, right? That's married I, I think and, so. and has two kids. Yeah. You know, so yeah. here, here's the that that. When we start to look at the details, that's really where it's important. Just because you have somebody who has the same name or you call somebody by the same name doesn't mean that we're talking about the same individual. And that's where we get into the problems with the the lodges, where people want to make it as broad as possible. I'm talking about this guy that's got brown hair. You know, okay, (laughs) that really narrows it down, right? (laughs) Yeah. But that's 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 not what we're talking about. Yeah, I – I I couldn't agree more, and I think you know, the one thing that 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 people you know, what what does what does Jesus say that we need to you know go to heaven? We need to have faith in what He did for us. Um, and if you don't have Jesus, then you can't go to heaven. It's pretty simple, you know. That's it's you need to have Jesus Christ. You need to have faith in Him, and uh, you know. These Masonic lodges, they yes, they believe in a God, a God who is the Father of all men and the uh, whatever the nameless one of a hundred names. But that is not Jehovah God. I don't know who they're praying to. Right. But they clearly are not praying to the same God that we're praying to, because we're pray, praying to the Trinity, 
and we believe that Jesus Christ is God and man and that he was our, you know, our advocate. There's so many – don't you lose so many different principles if you don't have a clear confession of who Christ is? Well, absolutely, and, and you, you look at those very clear passages in Scripture where Jesus made that very clear. He said, mm -hmm. everyone should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. If you don't honor the Son, then you don't honor the Son or the, the Father who sent him. If, if you reject Jesus, you do not have the Father. I mean, it's just – it's that plain and simple. Now, now you touched on another example here. This is really important when it comes to the work of our salvation. As Christians, we confess what the scriptures tell us, and that is that we are saved by God's grace through the active and passive obedience of Jesus in our place as our substitute. So he lived a perfect life in our place, which we could not do. He died the death that we deserved because of our sin. He did both of those things in order to accomplish our salvation. Now, let's go back to Freemasonry. In Freemasonry, how do they answer that question? How are you saved? What would the answer be? Well, they would say a lot of different things, but what it really boils down to is, you know, what every false religion boils down to, it's work righteousness. They say that uh, it's they describe themselves as a beautiful system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols so they're saying that th they have their own tenets of what is morally good and what is morally bad a freemason is supposed to be a very morally good person he's supposed to help out his fellow freemasons to the best of his ability as much as the law would allow um but you can see there that it's you know what makes a good work it's not we know this from the Bible. It's not just what the world considers to be a good work. It's, you know, by faith in Christ and a thankful heart for what he did for us. These Freemasons, they they do all kinds of things for each other. They're very charitable, but it, at the end of the day, they, they're, re, they're relying on those charitable deeds and acts, um, you know, they're, to save them. They're a very, you know, charitable group, and they probably do a lot of – quote unquote good in the world but at the same time that is no way shape or form can be relied on for salvation so in, in essence Freemasonry isn't any different than any of the other pagan religions of the world no. that is made you know it's, it's making a god in our own image that's saying yeah we can save ourselves one of their their basic tenets in masonry is character determines destiny now, if that's not moralistic, yeah, hopefully. I don't know what is. You know, you're, you're talking about this is what I'm, and, and you're right. They do a, a lot of wonderful things. We would call that civic or civil righteousness. From an outward perspective, a, a Mason is generally going to be a good person. The problem is, is that the Bible doesn't tell us that being a good person is actually going to get us into heaven. We have to be a perfect person, not just a good person, mm -hmm. and faith faith is what determines whether something is a good work in the eyes of God without faith the writer of the Hebrews says it is impossible to please God you can do all these wonderful things for your neighbor but if you, you if that's not coming from a heart that is filled with faith in Christ as your redeemer and savior who has paid your debt of sin it is not good in God God's eyes no matter how good it is in the eyes of human beings Right. Well, I'm, I'm happy you brought up that uh, justification concept there, Nathaniel, because, you know, universal justification, <clears throat> excuse me, is something that we we really we, – we depend on that universal justification. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Uh, what would the Freemasons – like, would they put restrictions on – who gets into heaven? Is there a heaven for them? Uh, what? Well, how would you answer that question? Well, well yeah, they they do have at least a, a concept of heaven. They talk about the, the great the great lodge in the sky. <laughs> in the sky, yeah. You know, so it's it, it's a concept about of heaven, but again, the way to get into that lodge in the sky is through one's own actions. It's about their their faithfulness to the, or adherence to the laws of of masonry, the guidelines, the tenets, the principles of it. And and so 
in the end, it just comes right back to work righteousness all over again, that we are, mm-hmm. we're, we're striving to save ourselves instead of looking to the one who has already saved us. And I think, you know, with the Freemasonry and Masonic Lodges, it's a very, to me, it's very interesting. You can, uh, you can lose yourself in the internet in researching this religious group because they have so many there's so many different tentacles i think that's how you put nathaniel of this religion it's you know it's pretty ancient it was going on here even before there was a country here in the united states um george washington was a freemason a lot of the founding fathers were as well um it's also pretty mystical i'd say there's it's not all common knowledge you know what what they do in their temples they're very you know restrictive you know well we me and you Nathaniel we try to get as many people into our churches as we possibly can we're supposed to spread God's word they do not do that they're not evangelical like that they want that you can become a Freemason but the onus is on the person to contact them and to get involved in them per- presumably by knowing a Freemason in their life and then trying to get an invite to a meeting and then you get voted in or not, you can get rejected too. So, you know, much different than, than how we would look at religion, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the way that, the way that they look at not just religion in general, but you know, the way of salvation, what its role is. Again, there's some similarities, you know, what, what masonry would really emphasize is what Christianity would call sanctification with that the aspect of morality. The problem is you can't have sanctification if you don't have justification. Mm. And the, the, the masons don't have justification, which means their sanctification becomes work righteousness. And so there's one of the biggest problems that we run into, not just with the Freemasons, but with all of those other organizations that are so similar to it in in saying we're going to we're going to describe God in this general way that everybody can agree on we don't want to make anybody upset uh we want to have this general view of God but by having a general view of God you don't have any god at all right it's kind of almost fellowship over doctrine right like yeah. to kind of to to be able to agree with each other they they don't really care you know what the other person believes they just want to be able to be in a part of this group together right you know you mentioned ben early on that that a lot of the founding fathers of our country were masons you know you think about ben franklin um james monroe george washington um a lot of the presidents throughout history, even since the founding fathers, but later on, Andrew Jackson, William Howard Taft, you know, they were Freemasons. It seems like there's a lot of famous people in other areas, though, too. I mean, you can go all the way back to uh, Mozart was a Mason. You know, and that was at the very beginning. The, the Mason organization was formed in, in the early 1700s. Uh, so Mozart would have been sort of on the ground floor uh, of that. A lot of people that are musically inclined, uh, gifted in, in the, the all different kinds of arts uh, throughout history have been involved in it. But what's really surprising to me, Ben, is that you can have – it doesn't surprise me that you would have somebody like uh, George Washington who was a, a deist. I mean, masonry fits with deism, the right. idea that there is a god. What's confusing is when you have somebody who professes to be a Christian who is a Mason. You know, for example, Francis Scott Key. Mm. You know, Francis Scott Key was – we've got hymns in our hymnal that are written by Francis Scott Key. Now, he's probably best known for the Star Spangled Banner, uh, but he wrote many religious hymns that are directly taken from Scripture. He professed to be a Christian. Jesse Jesse Jackson. Uh, now, we could argue whether he was a Christian or not, but mm. he was a professing Christian. How how do you reconcile the concepts of masonry with the Christian faith? It's, it's hard, right? Because it's impossible to do that when you understand really what, what true Christianity is. I think, you know, the Masons themselves, they would really – you know, they would kind of say 
what we're talking about, they would say is complete nonsense. They're like, no, 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 no. You guys got it all wrong. It's not that. It's not that. We just want to, you know, we just want, we all believe in God. We just want to, you know, get together. And they're wrong because if I am a Christian and I'm trying to be a Freemason as, as well, things are not going to be squared away as they would, uh, they like to use squared and the uh, <laughs> objects like the plumb line. Right. But, uh, so it just, it, Jesus Christ is not in line with the Freemason, Freemasonry and their doctrine because they say that anyone can, be, can believe in whatever God that they want. And that is not true. They're really, it's, it's funny how, Free Freemasonry is so exclusive. Like, not just anyone can be a Freemason. You right. have to know people, and right. you have to get voted in. But it's also so inclusive as well because <clears> – <throat> so once you pass that final round of, you know, is this person good enough? Is he a good enough person morally to become a Freemason? Then it doesn't really matter what your religious views are. You're accepted, and you can do – you can be a part of this fraternity. So it's it's weird how exclusive it is, but then it when it comes to at least moral works, you have to be a good enough person, you have to make enough money, and have enough influence. But when it comes to one's own religious viewpoints, it's very inclusive. You can believe whatever you want, and there that is so dangerous. So, in in essence, since we can't reconcile those two things, either what's happening is you are either not understanding the tenets of masonry mm -hmm. or you are not understanding the tenets of Christianity. Because if you do understand the tenets of both, you would have to say this is oil and water. These two are not in any way compatible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think, you know, you, you take that principle, not don't apply just to masonry. Look at any like any religious movement today like that, that movement of, you know, let's not, you know, get all riled up about differences. Let's agree to disagree and just, you know, have fellowship. Fellowship is good. It's good to, you know, have a sense of community. Like I'm sure, you know, these Freemasons are probably very thankful for their their brothers and it's probably something that they, you know, really look forward to going to. But that a fellowship that isn't based in doctrine is no fellowship at all. It's just a couple people getting together. You might as well be on a softball team, you know? So at least that's not gonna be spiritual harmful. This is because it states definite things about God and definite false things about God, and it makes religious uh, points of view, you know, to be equal. I can believe in Jesus, you can believe in Buddha, but, you know, we're both brothers of Freemasonry. And that, yeah, those things are just simply not compatible with one another. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's wrap this up. When we come back to the very basic principle that is – is the foundation for our salvation. You think about what Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus, and, and he said, this is what we all were at one point. We were without Christ. And when we were without Christ, we were having no hope. We were without God in the world. If we do not have Christ, if Christ is not the center, the focal point of our faith, of our religion, then we really don't have anything we are godless we are without god and that's what this this is all about hopefully this discussion will help people to see that like like we've talked about this isn't just in the masonry it's not just in freemasonry or the masonic lodge there's all these other examples throughout our lives where we have examples of groups like this that are proclaiming to say something about god and the fellowship that you were talking about ben that comes into this but it is a godless it is a godless organization because it has re rejected the one true god because it does not have christ right. any, any it, final thoughts yeah i just like to close with uh, a statement about how the masons describe themselves this is taken from their uh, kind of their creed in what is a mason a mason is a master of himself in the lodge of life he wears unstained the white lambskin of innocence from his initiation as entered apprentice, he travels ever toward the east in search of light and wisdom until he receives the final 
the divine password that admits him into the effable presence of the eternal supreme grandmaster and the universe god so just a few things from that i think you know they can, you can see that they do kind of draw on some tenets of of christianity that that lambskin is a very big thing for them but it just really makes me think of what do we what do we as christians rely on we rely on the holy spotless lamb of god who takes away the sin of uh, of the world and our sin as well and what is that divine password that admits us into heaven well it's not a password because it's not secret uh the divine password is jesus christ right and him crucified it's no password it is available to all it we're trying to spread that message to everyone we don't want to keep that a secret we want as many people to get in as possible yeah that that is interesting because a lot of the things that are like you said they 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 point out those tenets or draw from christianity they mean something very different by them mm -hmm. the the innocent uh, or the the unstained white lambskin as christians we think of of jesus but yep. they're talking about themselves yep. you know, their own righteousness uh, their search for truth you know we think oh that's a wonderful thing but they're looking mm -hmm. for truth in the wrong places and as you pointed out the password it's not something that god has kept secret this is something he has revealed to all people through his word he wants us to come to know that truth and what it is that opens the door to heaven for us well, thanks for taking us through this, Ben. This has been yeah. a, another another one of these religions that at least is a little closer to home for a lot of us. There's probably people that maybe not quite as popular as it was uh, generations ago in our own country, but still something that is uh, very prevalent. As you're driving down the road, you can see these symbols on the back of people's cars still today. Uh, mm -hmm. It helps you to realize, hey, here's some, here's an opportunity for me to, to witness about who Jesus is, the real source of our salvation still today. We hope that you'll join us again in the future. We have just a couple of these studies remaining in our non-Christian religions before we wrap this up. If you have any other thoughts or religions that you would like us to consider, please send us an email at burdenandblessing at gmail.com. We hope that you will join us again. May the Lord bless your week. We hope that you will join us next week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast. Our goal is always to bring you the whole counsel of God. Until next time, go in the strength of the Lord and preach the word.